So thank you again, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Interesting Part is, with no further ado, you saw the highlights. You, you, you probably know what I'm leaning into, but we have a Chicago legend on deck today that's gonna get out and share his story. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the platform today, Mr. Marcus Liberty. Hello, everyone. What's going on, man? Man, everything is everything, man. I'm just enjoying life, living to the fullest, man, and uh, trying to give back the best way I can. That's And man, you are doing an, an absolutely awesome job. Um, I know right now you are hosting, you are co-hosting a, a talk show, uh, an online talk show. How's that going? You know what, oh, man, when I first got the call and, and the gentleman, my co-host, he actually brought it to my attention about starting something in Chicago and he wanted to do something for the kids. But he didn't know how, how he really wanted to go about it. And I'm all about being positive. So I said, it, it has to be something positive for me to be in, in tune with it because I'm not going to put my name to something where we bashing, you know, especially our kind, yeah. bashing each other, uh, saying who's better, saying who's this. I said, I'm not about that. So he said, all right, cool. We'll ride with that. And then we came up with the name All Ball Chicago and we went out and started getting old flavor, new flavor and wanted to get them come on and just share their story, their upbringing, what they were all about, and the rest, is, it just took off. Oh, man, I, I had an opportunity the other day, and you hit on two key points, and I'm going to stay on track here, but I know I'm going to have some fun. I think initially we think in order to draw attention to ourselves, it has to be around uh, negativity. And I think one of the things that this COVID did was it showed a lot of us, especially young black men, it showed us that we could be positive and highlight ourselves um, in a positive way. So I appreciate you taking a stand there. Um, in addition, have you, in terms of talk shows and being in front of people, what was your comfort level? You know what, Al, when I first got into like playing basketball, man, I, I never liked to be in the front. You know, I always wanted to be in the back meaning when the cameras and, you know, the media, they want to talk. I was always in the back, man. I, didn't, I never, because I was afraid to talk, man, and because of, you know, it was never, it never happened to me in the hood, you know? So when I went to high school, now the microphones want to be in your face and you got to communicate and talk. I wasn't ready for that, man. All I wanted to do was play basketball because that's what I love to do. But it's another side of that. You know, when you become a star player, people want to hear from you. And that's right. I just had to build up to that, man, and I got used to it. And then I started talking more and more. And is I'll give you a story, man, about a professor I had at the University of Illinois. I was so quiet. She said, Marcus, if you don't open up and tell me what's going on, I can't help you. And that's always been my motto now. I tell that with my nephew. I tell that with my family members. If you don't talk and communicate, and if you wanting, you know, wanting help, it's not going to happen. If if you close your mouth. My dad always said a closed mouth, a closed mouth will not get fed. That's so interesting. The power of communication. Communication is king. Communication enables trust. There are so many interesting dynamics that go on, whether you're telling somebody some bad news, whether you're telling them some great, there's so much more that can be done. So I appreciate you empowering our audience around uh, that early nugget. When I go back, right, man, I think about you from a family perspective, watching you grow up. You came out in the class of 87. I yep. was in the class of 88. So you guys were a, an incredible example of what it should look like, right? Before anybody really knew what it was, y'all had the, the, the snap-offs and, the, and, the, and the, when you came in the gym and you walked through the hallways, it was electric. Uh, so let's start here. Family, you had a few, you had a couple of older brothers. Yes. And and yeah. would you say that you were always the best when it came no. to that? No. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wasn't even close to my older brothers, man. Edgar and Duro, you know, rest in peace, my brother Duro. Man, that's but funny. but I watched, I watched them a lot. I did a lot of watching, not playing, mm -hmm. you know, because they were so good, so talented when I was little. I used to watch them, and even my father. I got uncles. All of them, they played basketball, man. I was, I was a kid that just wanted to just hang out and throw rocks and, <laughs> and, and just be a kid, you know, like hanging out. 
I didn't I didn't get involved in basketball until later on, like man, sixth, seventh grade, you know, when I started playing. But yeah, my two older brothers, man, that they are the one that actually taught me the game. Inspired you. And, and so that was my next question. That's where that inspiration came from, right? Were yep. they high flyers? Did they play below the rim? Was it a combination? Yeah, uh, no, both of my brothers, you know, and, and you can see it in my game because I'm not a high flyer. I mean, I can dunk, but I wasn't one of those guys going to take off from the free throw line or anything like that. But my brothers always taught me to understand the game, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what they were doing with me when I was little. And that's why when people said, well, man, Marcus, your mid-range game was on point because that's what they were doing. Taking one, two, three dribbles, pull-ups, post-up, fake one way, go the other way. So they was teaching me all that stuff when I was little, man. So when I got older, it never went away. So the basic fundamentals, and I still teach that today to a lot of, you know, kids, the basic fundamental. Some, some, sometimes our kids, our young athletes get so caught up in, I got to do that flashy stuff right now. And then they miss, they miss what's really important. And that's the fundamental. That's and I think we need to get back to that. Yep, that was one of the things that stood out. And that was one of the most things I was proud about when I knew when I learned that you had started coaching and giving back, that there was going to be a group of kids in one of these cities across America that would be 100% fundamentally sound, right? You, you brought to the game a fundamental, you could tell that you were being taught the game as opposed to just kind of going through the motions. So you start at Crane. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you end up, I know you always, in the, in the prior footage, you talk about the effects that uh, Coach Landon Cox, rest in peace, uh, had on your career. Can you talk about that coach-student dynamic when, when you had the type of ability that you had? Yeah, it's important. It's important to have someone that you can, one, trust. Um, I trusted uh, Coach Cox. Um, he told me some things that I probably didn't even see in myself. You know, I was never one of those players that was going out for, let's be the number one player in the city. Let's be the number one player in the state. Let's be the number one player in the nation. I never set those type of goals. I just love playing the game of basketball. So when I got over to King High School, Coach Landon Cox was like, I'm going to make you the number one player in the country. And I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> you know, and I just took it just like that. You know, most people would have been like, for real? And got a little, you know, timid, nervous, or whatever. I was not nervous or anything. I was like, all right, coach, wherever you take me, I'm going to just show out. You know, I'm just going to play my game and do what I need to do. So make a long story short, you know, I wind up going to uh, Princeton, New Jersey, mm. playing in front of, like, a lot of college coaches that you see on television. I wasn't in awe or ooh about them. And then I saw a lot of players that, you know, you see in the USA Today and all these magazines street and you know, Street Smiths. Yeah. yeah, you know. So I'm like, man, okay. So I'm just, I'm just being me, you know. And when I got out of there, they were like, man, this kid is going to be the number one player in the country. And I was like, man, so my high school coach saw something in me that I didn't even see. Now let's fast forward, you know, to how he really, like, helped me become who I am. You know, I was one of those kids that was quiet, wasn't a lot, you know, vo very vocal at all. And he had to, you know, put it in me that, Marcus, you can either lead by, you know, example, meaning competing every time you step on the court, or you can be that vocal leader. I wasn't the vocal leader, but I was leading every time in every drill, trying to be the first. So I started to think like a point guard. And Tracy Dildy said this in a, in a newspaper article a long time ago when I was in high school. He said, it's almost like we have two point guards out here. Mm. You had Tracy Dildy. Who's a point guard, and you had myself who thought just like a point guard. So he was like, man, that's, that's cool. And I thought that team, that 83, 84 team, yes. was probably the best team that King had. Now, what was that, your sophomore year? That was my sophomore year. That was my sophomore year. I thought that team probably could have been the best team that Cox had because he has a lot of – we had a lot of super athletic guys, and – we ended up, you know, you know the story. We lost to Tilden that yeah. year, and and the rest was history. But Cox was a mastermind behind a lot of things, man. He took me in Lavertis downstate. I 
think Simeon, Ben Wilson, was playing downstate, and he he took Emil Levertis. Then I'm looking. I'm like, man, this is cool. I mean, you you got you you got you playing in this big old arena, and is you playing for a state championship? And I told, I looked at Levertis, and I said, we got to get down here. So Cox was doing things, man, that a lot of coaches weren't doing. He was seeing his vision. He was seeing things before it even happened. So I was like, now I get what you was doing, coach. You wanted us to see this environment. That's right. Give us a taste of it so we can be hungry. That's right. And so you go on, and and you talked a little bit about, um, that was a topic I had, the power of choice, right? These days, you know, when, when we were growing up, if mama cooked something for dinner, that's what you ate for dinner, right? You didn't get a chance to say, well, no, nah, I'm not eating that today, right? The power of choice was different. Um, I watch you right now work with your nephew, right? Uh, Javon Friedman, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, currently a student athlete at DePaul University, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, formerly at Valparaiso, uh, was a high school All-American for all intents and purposes out of Whitney Young. Um, power of choice. How do you work with him around making quality choices and, and how much involvement does that look like from a parental standpoint? Yeah, I, I always told Javon, I'm going to help you as much as I can, but I also want you to understand what's going on. You know, college is a business. Now, I mean, no, no matter how people want to say it's all about education, it's a business. NCAA is making money off of players going to the university. That's right. So I had to tell him that. I said, so if you're going to be the number one option for what, whatever school you choose to go to, you have to look at that. You know, if you want to win championships or you want to, you know, build your own brand and, and hopefully get to that on your own, meaning like when he went to Valparaiso, they had some steam. They were doing some good things over there. But Javon, you know, he made a decision. He said, I don't think the Valpo can take me to where I need to go, mm-hmm. you know, and that's his decision, you know. And so many times people get caught up in, well, his uncle told him to leave and this and that. No, I never told Javon to leave Valparaiso. Javon Freeman made his own decision and said, you know what, this is where I need to be. And he made that decision on his own. And I told him this is the cons and the pros. That's right. You're going to get some people that think they really know you and be want to throw darts at you and say, why did you do this to our program and this we cared about you? Do you really care about them? Because if you really did care about the kid, you'll still be in his corner. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. So, right, so, right. I, so I, 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 I let Javon understand the business side of it. You're going to have people that's going to say, man, I'm riding with you through thick and thin. And then you're going to have some people to say, I was just with you because you were here at Falbo. Now, get on to the next. Putting cheeks in our seats. I get it. Yeah. So you go on, right? And you become the number one player in the country. And I need you to understand. I get chills right now. I, I need you to understand like what it looks like from my angle. A kid growing up on the north side of Chicago, 6'5", 6'6", thought he had a little game, watching your ascension, right? And watching you grow up. And they used to have, in Sports Illustrated, they would go player of the year 87, player of the year 88, player of the year 89, player of the year. And it went all the way down, I think, at that point to Damon Bailey. Yeah. All the way to like the class. Of, and I saw you in this magazine, man. What did that, how did that transform you? How big of a deal was that to you? I mean, at home, in the hood, across the country, how big of a deal was that? Well, that was my second time leaving the state, you know, leaving the state of Illinois, because they did that shoot in New York. Uh, My first time leaving the state was uh, our high school team. I think it was in 86. We had went to Cincinnati. That was my first time leaving the state. Uh, In New York. In high school. Okay. And then, you know, in the camps, of course, we, we went, you know, after that to the camps okay. you know, out of the state. But I'm saying New York, the big city. Yes. Uh, they took, you know, me there. I think Alonzo Morning was there. Yes. Uh, Kenny Anderson was Kenny there. Anderson. Uh, and um, so they had me do all these poses, man. I'm like, what is this for? You know, they say, like, oh, it's just going to be, you know, something for a magazine, you know. And, and I was like, okay. So they... They caught the picture, the one you're talking about, with me yeah. just like holding the form yes. and just following through, and 
and like next week I was in the, you know, the paper, I mean, in the magazine, the sports illustrator. And I showed my mom and my dad, I was like, wow, look at this. Because I was one of those kids, you know, you want to see yourself in the newspaper, especially at something like that, like yeah. sports illustrator. So I ran out and got a couple of copies and gave them to my family and friends. Right. And I'm like, man, I'm on sport. I'm in sports illustrator, you know? And my father said, set me down. He said, boy, don't you believe nothing the media says about you? You know, that's fine if you're in the paper and you're doing the newspaper and you're in the magazines. He said, but don't believe that hype. Wow. And and I took that, you know, I took that to, to this very day. I use that, you know, that people are gonna say great things about you. People are gonna say bad things about you. It's who you wanna be, who you are. And I and I and I always looked at that out like. I know who I am. So it doesn't matter if Al, if you say, man, Marcus, you was the greatest, man. You was the greatest that ever did. That's your opinion, right? But I know exactly who I am. And a lot of people don't know who exactly who they are. So I never let that get to my head. Never let it get caught up in the hoopla of who's best, who's that. You know, I love playing against Dennis Scott. I love playing against Sean Higgins, all those guys that was ranked nationally. But I never, I never came off that, man, I'm better than you. I'm the shit. Excuse my language. I don't know if, you know, we can talk like that on there, but I never thought that I was better than anyone. I looked at everyone as equal. Now, when it comes to competing, of course, that's going to come out when you step on the basketball court. But I never went in there saying that I'm better than anyone. That's, you know what, that, that's interesting. I remember, and, and right, I'm going to go there. We got our Sunday run, and we play against one another. And I, I guess I was early 30s. And uh, Richard Smith, one of one, of, I know that's 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 your best buddy. Um, yeah. He and I have become extremely close. But shout out to Richard Smith, uh, Deputy Chief CPS. Um, he brought you in the gym, and I guarded you that day. And mm -hmm. I was, I'm gonna tell you, I ain't, I ain't humility. I was excited. Yeah. The game go to 15, and I was so excited that by the time I looked up. You had scored all 15, <laughs> you had scored all 15 points, and we got a chance, you know, we fellowship afterwards, but we got a chance to talk, and just the humility, right? You, what you just said, understanding who you are, I think that's a huge message for a lot of these kids, and I think that's why a lot gets lost in translation these days, because yeah. they're, they're trying so hard to figure out who they are, what's my position, what, what am I strong at, what it, and so I, I I appreciate you you hitting on that. Um, so when you think back, right, and we'll move past. But when you think back, what was your soundtrack to life back then when you was going through those high school days and entering into the University of Illinois? What do you if I had to ask you three songs? What was the soundtrack to your life back then? Man, I can remember the songs too, man. Audio two. Audio. Top, <laughs> top billing. That's what we get. We got it good. Yeah. That was one of that was one of my you know songs that I used to listen to a lot. And then uh, of course Eric B and Rakim. Oh. I ain't no joke. Ain't <laughs> you, no. So so and then I you have to go. You got you got to throw a uh, uh, public enemy in there. You know. Public enemy. Uh, uh, public enemy, you know, I met, I actually met Chuck D, man, when I was uh, in the league, man, and he, real cool dude, man, and um, so I just, you know, Rebel Without a Pause, you know, that was one of, you know, one of the songs that I used to listen to, and so that would be it, man, like, and, and of course you could throw, I could throw in a lot of songs, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, but, but, you know, LL, LL Cool J, LL. you know, was, was doing his thing, I mean, you know, Run DMC, of course, Run DMC, uh, uh so we we can we can go all and don't and then you know I got to throw in my 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 house music you know coming from Chicago, uh, Farley you know Keith I mean he was doing his thing uh, Steve Silk Hurley, you know uh, yeah. so coming up you know growing up in Chicago man house music is the number one you know and it wasn't until I actually got a taste to go on that what East Coast uh, my McDon when I went played in the McDonald All American game that's when I really started to get into that hip hop. You know, Will Smith, uh, Fresh Prince, you know, we I was listening to that when I went out to Philadelphia. 
Yeah. And it was, man, it was cold, man. I was like, man, the way they was, you know, putting those words together and flowing like that, you know. Of course, I heard it on the radio, but we were so busy into the house music that we didn't hear a lot of uh, hip hop. You talk about 87, man. One of the things that that disco and house music did for me in the city of Chicago was it gave me a sense of family. You, you would dance. That was back in the days when you would dance, right? You would dance at the party. It gave you an opportunity to, to really get to know people. We get and you footwork and you, you know, and so although I have a strong love for hip hop and the, and the rap music, I think coming up, it's interesting that you hit on that hip hop because it, I mean, that, that disco and that house music, because it gave me a sense of, 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 of family, right? Yeah. So now you move on to the, that's a pretty nice playlist. You learn a lot about a person through the music that they listen to. I agree. I agree with you 100%, Al. And, 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 and let's take it even a step further. It, I look at music just like a book, right? Like uh -huh. we're in class, you know, you, you want to learn something, you're going to listen to, uh, you're going to read this book if you want to learn something, right? Same thing with music, you know, if you really want to get down and, and really know what's going on with certain things that, and that happen, like if you listen to Public Enemy, if you listen to uh, BDP, they basically talking about what's going on right now in the yes. world, you know, so, so you get that, you get the education part. So now let's go back to the house music. The house music is mellow music. So you mellow, right? You're not thinking about violence. You're not thinking about, you know, certain, you're just thinking about, man, I'm chill. I'm in chill mode. I'm dancing. I'm moving my head. I got my footwork right. Yeah. You know, and when I'm done, I'm going home. You I'm know, maybe go home, home with a young, a, a young lady, whatever it may be. But you're not, you're not thinking about going out robbing or shooting or killing anyone. You know, so I think, man, the music sometimes can confuse our young generation. You know, they listen to some of this music and, and the way they talk and the way they speak and and, and some of it is good music and some of it is, you know, just rat-a-tat-tat-tat, you know, that's, that's, that's shoot them up, you know. And, and I think sometimes it can be misconstrued to a lot of our kids that, man, let me go out there and try to do this. <laughs> you know, no, man. Do, doing, what you, doing what you think. I tried to play some house music. Hold on one second. All right. I, I, I put it on... Because it is, it, it's it's a mellow vibe, and and yeah. to your point, music is directional. It does give you energy to do certain things. If you ride in your car, and it's nice scenery. You may turn it up a little louder, you know, so forth. And so I often get into people's playlists because I know that that's a that's a leeway into their thought process, yeah. you know, so forth and so on. So so you move on to the University of Illinois, um, and you join this incredible group. Uh, young men at an early age. Did y'all know right away what 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 it was? No, no. Um, you you know because well, you know certain things like you know what kind of players you're getting. You know uh, uh, Nick Anderson. You know played at Simeon. Yes. Irvin played at Simeon. Kendall. Uh, so we all knew each other from just playing in camps or, or going to different tournaments in the summer league and playing against each other. Like I played, played in the summer against Larry Smith, uh, played, with, played against Nick and Kendall. Uh, Steve Barter was at that camp at the University of Illinois that we went to. So we all kind of knew each other and what we was capable of doing uh, and watching Lowell Hamilton play. You know, he was a little er older than me. Um, but I watched them play downstate, you know, at Providence St. Mel. Yes. So, but we never like talk, like you see kids talking now that we're going to team up. Let's team up and make something big. It just happened that way. Mm. You know, Coach Collins, uh, who was the assistant coach, Jimmy Collins at the University of Illinois, but he lived in Chicago. He was doing a lot of, you know, stuff, you know, things for, you know, at, at risk kids, you know, he was a probation officer. Uh, so he knew the city, uh, so he had the connections already, and he built the relationships, man. Once he got to the University of Illinois, building relationships with us, and the rest is history, man. Yeah, that that was crazy. Uh, the intensity, um, I think that sometimes that gets lost. Um, the the intensity and commitment. We back in the days we could, and I don't, I'm not real big on back in the days because I I know that 
time evolves and there's evolution of everything. But right. the, the, the fundamental difference was we got a chance to play maybe once or twice a week. Nowadays, even with my son, I saw them playing games, two or three games a day. Uh, you get a chance to get your lick back, right? Uh, so oftentimes I don't see the level of intensity. How intense was some of those practices when you think about it? You just talked about five NBA pros, essentially, right? Um, at a young age. How intense were those were those practices? It was um... – it was it was very intense, man, because you had guys that was a little older, you know, and, and you got to you got to remember, Al, I was a prop 48. So I was a proposition 48. So I didn't even get a chance to really compete and practice with them. But before that, like the, sum, the spring and the summer when I you know attended the University of Illinois, we would do a lot of pickup games. And man, those games were super like you you would think that it was pros man really we was just high, we was just college you know first second year college players and third year college players but everybody was getting dunked on people getting the ball taken from people getting mad and screaming at each other man people you know elbowing you know each other people like man I'm not bagging down from you That's and right. then right after that we back cool again oh, you know yeah. so but that intense on that basketball court between those 95, 94 by 50 feet, man, we were we were going at it, man. And, and, and that's what I loved about, you know, just playing in Chicago in general. And I know we talk about the University of Illinois, but just playing in basketball in Chicago in general, no matter what, we had we had that edge about us that meant that mental, that mental part of it. And we was athletic, but we also had that that hunger. Yep. Man, we want to. We don't want to lose because that's what you build on the playgrounds, right, Al? So yeah. you know, think about this: if you lose, you, you ain't get, get back, back on the court. court. You might not get back on the court. It's so that mentality that we had, we all brought it together. You know, it's like we ain't trying to lose here at the University of Illinois, man. So whoever we play against, it doesn't matter because we, we want to stay on this. We want to stay on this court. And you saw that in that Final Four run that we made. That's we right. didn't. We was like, man, we're not trying to. We're not trying to go back to Champagne. That's right. It was. It was. That was. That was prior to you know the whole Bulls run and everything. And it was extremely. You know, I was in my first, second year of college. It was extremely rewarding, man, to see cats that I knew, you know, out there putting in that work. And I'm off in Florida, and I can say, look, I know them. You know, I know them guys. That that that's Chicago, right? And it gave you a certain it gave you a certain moxie about yourself and all of, all of a sudden the perception, like you were from, you from where they from, it gives you just a leg up. And so that leads me into, you know, as we look at our current student athletes, we walked around a certain way. There was a pride about playing for our teams and for our high schools. We wore our jackets. I know, I know at King, y'all had all the gear. Um, but, how would you how would you suggest that student athletes in today's world walk around these streets that aren't always the 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 the, the, the safest when it comes to how would you suggest they they, they kind of move around? What would be your thoughts? Well, in in today's game, it's it's it's, it's hard because of especially the violence that we have in Chicago. Uh, we have to find a safe place, you know, for for our kids to go learn the game. Uh, Sometimes, you know, you, you can see hunger, you know, in, in certain kids that really want it. Mm -hmm. Like, I think Javon, Javon, their era, like that that group with Chase Adams and yeah. Taylor Horton, I think they are the ones that's going to really, uh, you can see what they're going to be all about. They love playing basketball. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to bring it back to where it used to be, where guys meeting up and just playing, just hooping. <laughs> you know, I think we, we can get that back. I think that group is going to do it. And then I think they got to pass it back down somewhere down the road or down the line. Somebody dropped the ball for, you know, because we missed a big gap yes. of, of what's going on. It's violence everywhere. It's violence everywhere. So, but Chicago just for some reason gets that, you know, that big light shining on them that, man, the violence is crazy, you know, this and that. And, and, that, and then the, and you can't go outside and play. You can't do anything. Uh, so, it's got to be a place that they can meet up and go hoop and, and be safe. 
You know, it's a lot of police officers that's out there that's our buddies. Yeah. That will make sure that these kids are good, good. you know, because they're doing something, they're trying to go somewhere. Um, I think we just we just need to get come to, together as a community and figure it out. And it's not that hard. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to find a gym, you know, a high school gym, say, you know what, this is what these kids need to be. Basketball, man, how you know this. Basketball is what grabs kids. It can reach. It can touch you, you know. But if you're trying to do something and, and, and educate a kid, let the basketball grab them, and yeah. then you start to tell the, your story of what you're really trying to do. And that's what happened to me. I wasn't trying to play no basketball. I, I, I never dreamed of playing in the NBA. That was not my goal. As a matter of fact, I never had a goal, right? So, but basketball was so good to me, I started to understand where can it take me? It can take me from this neighborhood that I'm in. It can give me a chance to get an education at the University of Illinois. Mm. It can give me a chance, an opportunity to go play basketball if I want to pursue my career and go play over in Europe. I wasn't thinking about NBA. I was like, I can go play in Europe and probably make some money doing this you know, for four or five years or six years or whatever it may be. But I knew I couldn't play basketball for no forever. I knew it was going to die out sometime. So I had to, you know, have an exit plan. And a lot of people don't have that exit plan. They don't know. It's like basketball is done. Now what? Now what I'm going to do. Now what I'm going to do. It's interesting, right? So you go class 89, y'all go to the final four. I, I'm, I'm almost certain that that was an exhilarating experience. Um, you play one more year and then you, you, you play your junior year, right? Have a yep. solid junior year. And then you get drafted by, was it Denver. The, oh, the, the, the Denver Nuggets? Yeah. How, how was that experience? Right. You move out West. Yeah. I, and, and again, nothing planned. I didn't plan that I was going to leave school early. That was not my main, uh, my family financial situation was not the best, but that still was not the number one reason I left. I left because the NCAA came and investigated. They was talking about Deion Thomas at the, at that time about receiving some kind of benefits and they investigated. And I was like, I want to be on TV. I want to be on television. My last, you know, at least get an opportunity to be seen by, you know, scouts, NBA scouts and, and, and whatnot. But, I didn't know. I didn't know what was going to happen. So I said, you know what? My family is not in the best situation. I had a pretty decent year. You know, I was 17 points, like close to eight rebounds a game. So I'm like, and playing in the Big Ten, out of position. You know, so I'm like. What you was playing the four? I was playing four. Yeah. You know, and, and, and so I said, you know what? Let's do it. I said, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know if I'm going to go first round. I don't know if I'm going to go second round. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to put my name in the draft, and I'm not going to take it out. And I'm going to see what happens. I'm going to work my butt off. And if they give me the opportunity to make a team, then so be it. I'll make it. And they gave me the Denver Nuggets, drafted me in the second round, and gave me that opportunity, man. And the rest was history. Yeah. And then you went and played. You played there. I know I, I remember seeing you in Detroit. How many? Yep. So it was those two? Yep, it was those two. Uh, so I only played four years. I played three years with Denver and then one with Detroit. Okay. And then I did a couple of tryouts for a couple of NBA teams. I did for Cleveland and I um, can't think of the other one. Uh, Toronto. Okay. When Isaiah Thomas was, you know, there. So I, I worked out for Toronto. And I'll, I'll tell you a story, man, about how it all went down, how – if you remember what we was talking about at the beginning, how I was loving the game of basketball, my father yeah. them taught me and my brothers and them, and I was loving it. I let, I let someone take the love away from me, you know, meaning a coach that was always negative, always putting you down, never building me back up. And it got to a point where it like completely broke me down. Like I don't want to play no more, but I knew I had a family. You know, I had a family to feed, so I was like, I'm going to stick it out just to get the checks. You know, I'm going to get the checks, make sure my family is good, and I'm going to roll with the punches. 
But mentally, man, it just really broke me down. So when it was time for me to go work out for Toronto, when Isaiah Thomas was there, he sat me down, man, I, after the workout. And he said, man, I remember you in high school, dude. You loved the game and you was, you was that dude. And he's like, I can see it in your eyes. You don't love it no more. And that was it for me. When I heard that, I said, I'm done, man. I can't, I can't keep doing this. I don't want to keep putting my family through this. I don't want to keep putting myself through that. So I stopped. And then I got a call from a buddy of mine, Reggie Williams, who was coaching at a semi-pro team. And then I started getting into coaching. And I started liking it. So I was like, this is what I want to do. So when I started, you know, moving around, like I was moving around different states. I, I was in Houston doing a little bit of a sports agency, recruiting and training their guys. And then I said, you know what? I need to start my own thing. And I'm, I'm here now starting my own program, uh, youth program where I help kids, uh, develop kids. And then I jumped into this podcast. This just fell in my lap, but I yeah. love it. You know, so I love it. You know, I love giving back some knowledge, you know, sharing my stories, you know, with list, our listeners. So it's just a win-win situation for me. I'm doing something I still love and I'm giving back. That's huge, man. We're going we're gonna to end this up. We're going to play. We tend to play this word association. Once again, the interesting part is Power by the Ambassadors. I'm your host, Kiss Allen. Um, we have a Chicago legend on deck today, uh, Mr. Marcus Liberty. We're going to move into word association. I'm going to ask you some words and you just tell me uh, just one word responses, right? And it's going to be tough, but just see if you can do it. All right, you ready? Okay. All right. Money. Wow. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Integrity. Mm. Have it. Family. Always. Loyalty. Important. Education. Crucial. Last one. Legend. Me. <laughs> hey, man. Hey. I, before I let you go, man, is there anything, right? Because then I'll end this up here. But is there anything that Maybe you want our audience to know, you know, the thought was to just share your story, right? Share your experiences and empower others through your experience, because it's a pretty fascinating story. Um, is there anything that maybe we didn't talk about that, that you want the audience to know about you? Well, understand what it takes, what success looks like. I didn't, I didn't understand it at the time when, when my coach, high school coach was, you know, giving me some advice and showing me things, understanding who you really are. I mean, we, we forget that we spend 24 seven with ourselves, but we so busy looking and worrying about someone else. Mm. So I, I would tell our, your listeners to spend time with yourself. And that doesn't mean you are crazy when you start talking to yourself. You know, people be like, well, why are you talking to me? Well, you look yourself in, your, in the mirror and say to yourself, each and every day you come home, did I do the best that I can do? Or did I, was I the best person I can be today without me being negative? Because a lot of times we so negative and worried about what somebody else had, we forget about ourselves, man. Wow. So know who you are, understand what's your purpose, because I think we got that's important. You got to understand what's your purpose in life. And it may take you a while. It didn't take me that long to understand who I was and who I'm trying to implement, uh, implement like my dad. I want to be just like my dad. My dad was a hard worker. I watched him work hard. I, walked, I watched him work his butt off. I just wanted to be the best father I can be, you know, and I watched him do it. And he worked and he did it. So you, listeners out there, Quit trying to be a rapper. Quit trying to be a, a hooper. If, that, if that's what you want to be, then be that for you, not for LeBron James, not for Kobe Bryant, not for Marcus Liberty. Be it for who you think that's, that should be. You know, it, it, it can't go any other way. Man, listen, this has been an absolute pleasure. Really quickly, man, tell our audience where they can follow you. I know you have the podcast. I know you have your own uh, business. 
Um, but where could they follow you? If, if, you know, as you continue to build your brand, where can they follow you? Well, I'm on Facebook under Marcus Liberty and then, uh, yeah, All Ball Chicago. We got, we got a group page on Facebook. Um, and then Give Me Liberty uh, is my Twitter. Uh, Instagram, I think Liberty Edge, yeah, Liberty Edge uh, Basketball is my Instagram. Um, you can find me anywhere, man. Just, you know, Google it and, and it should all pop up. But Al, I just want to say something, man, that you and uh, Danielle, y'all doing a wonderful job of educating our young youth. Uh, keep doing what you guys are doing, man, because it takes a village, man. It doesn't take Marcus Libby by himself. We all need to come together and have that common goal, and that's to help our young generation. My man. The interesting part is where we talk to the most interesting people about the most interesting thing, um, the talk show, uh, powered by Steve Bassiters. On deck today, we had a legend, and he dropped nuggets. We want to thank you all for joining us today, and always in party, remember, love yourself and know who you are. Peace. Peace.